Content warning for suicide, Nazism, mutant mental manipulation, and the complete collapse of galactic civilization. Action! Excitement! Horror! Romance! Thrills and chills! Swords and sorcery! Rockets and ray guns! A dizzying canopy of the strange and impossible from the darkest depths of the human imagination! What mad universe encompasses such tales as these? Join us as we bear witness to the sweeping sprawl of all the history that never was and all the futures that could yet be. It's adventure as you like it on What What Mad Universe. Coming destruction of Trantor is not an event in itself, isolated in the scheme of human development. It will be the climax to an intricate drama which was begun centuries ago, and which is accelerating in pace continuously. I refer, gentlemen, to the developing decline and fall of the Galactic Empire. Do you realize, Dr. Selden, that you are speaking of an empire that has stood for 12,000 years through all the vicissitudes of the generations, and which has behind it the good wishes and love of a quadrillion human beings? I am aware both of the present status and the past history of the empire. Without disrespect, I must claim a far better knowledge of it than any in this room. And you predict its ruin? It is a prediction which is made by mathematics. I pass no moral judgments. Personally, I regret the prospect. Even if the Empire were admitted to be a bad thing, an admission I do not make, the state of anarchy which would follow its fall would be worse. It is that state of anarchy which my project is pledged to fight. The fall of Empire, gentlemen, is a massive thing, however, and not easily fought. It is dictated by a rising bureaucracy, a receding initiative, a freezing of caste, a damning of curiosity, a hundred other factors. It has been going on, as I have said, for centuries, and it is too majestic and massive a movement to stop. The Empire will vanish, and all its good with it. Its accumulated knowledge will decay, and the order it has imposed will vanish. Interstellar wars will be endless. Interstellar trade will decay. Population will decline. Worlds will lose touch with the main body of the galaxy. And so matters will remain. Forever? Psychohistory, which can predict the fall, can make statements concerning the succeeding Dark Ages. The Empire, gentlemen, as has just been said, has stood 12,000 years. The Dark Ages to come will endure not 12, but 30,000 years. A second empire will rise, but between it and our civilization will be 1,000 generations of suffering humanity. We must fight that. Isaac Asimov was born in Russia, smack dab in the middle of the revolution, his exact birth date isn't even known, and came to America at the age of five. As an adult, he earned a doctorate in chemistry and wrote or edited literally hundreds of books, many of them nonfiction. In fact, his books fall under every category of the library's Dewey Decimal System. But Asimov is best known as the so-called grandmaster of science fiction for his genre stories and novels published during and immediately after World War II, of which the best known are his stories about the laws of robotics and the Foundation series, which we're going to talk about today. I'm Adam Prosser, with me is Philip Rice. Hello. Welcome to What Mad Universe, Season 2. Yay. Hooray. <laughs> so yes, after a, a bit of a break to do a lot of reading, which of course we need to do, um, we're, uh, we're ready to start talking again about uh, the origins of genre and pulp sci-fi and fantasy. And uh, so yeah, we're looking at the Foundation series. This is one of the more well-known ones we're uh, tackling here. Um, this is a pretty, uh, this is a pretty big one if you're a science fiction fan. Um, it's, uh, I guess Asimov's a little more well known for the robotics books, but. Definitely. That's what I know him for. Yeah. Yeah. But the, so you, had you heard of the foundation books before? Uh, or? before, uh, you, you had talked about them in like years ago, but mm. I think I heard about them from you. I, right. I, I had assumed they were like part of the robotics series. Well, in a and way, they sort of are. They are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but yes, no, they were originally, he, he wrote, um, a ton of short stories, um, in terms of novels, he didn't write, it, basically his, his, uh, his, uh, career is a lot of short stories written, especially for Astounding Magazine. Um, 
uh, he uh, he wrote of the series he wrote Foundation uh, Robotics and the Empire series, which kind of came later and is actually specifically supposed to be in the same universe as the Foundation series, kind of filling in the the earlier history of that. Uh, and then uh, he wrote some novels in the fifties, and uh, then he kind of he he said he lost interest in fiction and he did uh, nonfiction writing through most of the sixties and seventies, and finally he kind of got cajoled back into doing. Uh, uh, science fiction, specifically to writing uh, more Foundation books in the uh, early 80s. Um, so um, I uh, was told uh, to read the Foundation trilogy, which is the first three books. Right. Uh, the first one, which is a, uh, a collection of short stories that were put together in a book form. Right. Actually, and they all are. The entire oh, okay. uh, trilogy is what's called fix-up novels. It's all um, short stories that were all compounded into one. I, yeah, I, I thought the that. second one was two novellas. I, well, yes. I mean, it's okay. novels, not short stories, and novels. But I, you're right. I thought the, the second, the final, uh, not book was one complete novel. But it, it is apparently two stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, it's funny because you've probably now read them more recently than I have. Uh, I was brushing up on the first book because I, it's been a while. But the other ones, I, it's been a few months since I read them. <laughs> so you might actually have to remind me some of the stuff. But I, do, I, from uh, it's I, been a few weeks for me. So well, yeah, exactly. You've read them more recently than I have. I, no, I did read reread the first book. Um, when I read them the first time as a kid, uh, I found them. You know, they were interesting. I was, uh, you know, Asimov is actually, we were actually assigned an Asimov story uh, in public school. And, really? Uh, yeah. And uh, it was the, the Ugly Little Boy, which we then uh, saw the movie of. And I think it was to compare the movie and the TV and the and the story that he'd written. Uh, and it was, he the, the teacher gave us out a collection of Asimov uh, stories. And I really got into it and I just read all the other Asimov stories because I liked them a lot. He's got another book called uh, The Last Answer, which uh, covers like billions of years of galactic history uh, in which people are constantly asking, you know, what's the meaning of life, basically, mm-hmm. to a computer which grows and become and starts to, you know, uh, uh, dominate the course of human affairs over the as the years go on. Um, and that, so he likes that that arc of yeah. like civilizations growing and rising and falling. And this is literally just a short story, but it goes all the way to the end of the universe, mm-hmm. basically, uh, which is really really interesting. Um, anyway, it's it's uh, but yeah. So I was into Asimov, so I tracked down the Foundation. Although I haven't read all the robots stories actually, but I read the Foundation series, uh, and I found them you know interesting idea wise. But I was finding the stories a bit slow going for the specific reason that. Uh, it's literally about someone who's worked out everything in advance and set people going on it. Uh, but then it kicks in halfway through the second book because he introduces a new sort of crazy wrinkle to it, right? Mm-hmm. Let's just explain. Actually, Phil, you want to uh, summarize the uh, the story that we've got here? Oh, the, putting me on the, the spot here. Yeah, okay. Um, Harry Seldon is a uh, psychohistorian and a mathematician. Mm-hmm. Uh, psychohistory is... It's called That Branch of Mathematics, which deals with the reactions of human conglomerates to a fixed social and economic stimuli. Makes sense. Uh, right. It is um, basically um, the study of, uh, of humanity as, as a mass, as a mass, as opposed, it can't predict individual actions, but it can predict what will happen over centuries. Right. Yeah, it's it's saying you know oh well we can predict that as as we said in the intro there you can know you can predict oh yeah our the empire that we it starts out with a giant galactic empire and says look this is going to fall uh, and then there's going to be barbarism and we sh- we need to redirect it in such and such a way that it will form a uh, you know will it'll come back together as a better society essentially mm-hmm. um, and yeah it is also and he he specifically based it Asimov uh, based it on the uh, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, the 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 Edward Gibbons uh, series of uh, nonfiction books, which uh, y- are you familiar with those at all? I've heard of them. Yeah, that was that was for a long time. That was the definitive uh, series on you know the the history of the Roman Empire. Um, although, of course, people challenged it endlessly. But it's it's the kind of thing of well, yeah, but you start from challenging it, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, you agree with it or you don't agree with it, but it's there. You can't mm-hmm. avoid it, right? Uh, and Asimov said he'd read that twice. He actually said the idea for this came from, uh, he had a meeting with uh, W. John Campbell, uh, who, as we've discussed before, is the editor of Astounding, and he had to pitch an idea. He didn't know what he was going to pitch. It's in the middle of World War II, actually. Uh, or just before World War II, actually, um, Ameri- for America. And uh, he went into, uh, he had to go in and pitch it, and he he basically literally just grabbed a book off the shelf, and it was something else. Uh, I think it was 
Gil- uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, and okay. he said Yolanthe, uh, okay. which was apparently has some reference to like the Roman Empire or something. It's about fairies, but yeah, okay, probably somehow his his <laughs> he sort of followed a train to the idea of rises and fall of the Roman Empire, and he said, "Well, wait a minute, what if it was about uh, you know that essentially?" Mm-hmm. So so he he sort of said, "What if I did a sci fi version of the decline <clears throat> fall of the Roman Empire?" And he came up with the whole psycho history. So apparently he just came up with this you know right before the meeting and pitched <laughs> it, and he said literally because it's very it's got a bit of a serialization to it. Uh, somewhat and he said uh like he ended the first book uh the first story with a cliffhanger uh because he wanted to make sure campbell would buy the next story (laughs) um uh, but i should point out by the way the first uh, the first quote novel is very clearly a series of short stories it was originally four short stories but he went back that first story is actually one he added later he came back and wrote to it it usually it originally started with the foundation and um uh, the the mayor, uh, what's his name? Salver Harden. Salver Harden. Yeah, he's uh, he's the. Um, uh, it starts with him saying, "No, we've got to do something." Like it, the the story is, uh, the foundation has been there working on this Encyclopedia Galactica because um, uh, uh, Harry Seldon, the psycho historian, convinces the Empire to establish a foundation he says well what we'll do is we'll write an encyclopedia galactica which will uh maintain knowledge through the dark ages and it'll be it'll be crucial to uh to the foundation of the new empire that will rise after the dark ages and they said okay fine and th- and they of course the empire liked that because it's an excuse to get him out of there and yeah. to, and send him to the edge of the galaxy terminus a planet called terminus and the first story uh, that were again the original first story starts with Salvar harden who's the mayor uh, but he's just sort of an administrator, whereas the foundation, the pe- the bureaucrats of the foundation are the important people. Uh, and they're saying, you know, and, and they're starting to see political turmoil and tension between the nearby kingdoms as the empire collapses. And they says, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, and they're saying, well, we stay neutral. We stay neutral. We don't do anything. And Hardin basically says, no, no, we have to get involved because we're not going to have a choice. They're going to come and they're going to invade us and take us over. And uh, they said, no, 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 we stay neutral. But then Harry Seldon appears in a vault because you pre recorded a bunch of uh, messages over the course of for the next thousand years that he's planning his uh, foundation and he said oh uh by the way um i, I knew th- i never it wasn't about the encyclopedia i never really cared about that that was just to guys get you here so you could start to reform civilization so now you have to make a move and politically and you will get have to get involved politically and uh, salver harden had already been planning this and he literally seizes control he's actually a coup he talked yeah about. he seemed yeah. kind of machiavellian right or very, yeah. Yeah, and that is that is one of the things that happens. So you've got these leaders, um, and it is it, it is um, interesting from that perspective because Asimov takes a very detached view, but he does portray sort of almost like well, sometimes you need a Machiavellian guy. You know? Yeah, although, uh, and this is something I wrote later in the notes, but we might as well bring it up here. Mm-hmm. Um, this book sort of sidesteps the great man theory of history for the most part. Right. Uh, that's um, it was sort of formulated in 1841 by historian Thomas Carlyle in his book On Heroes, Hero Worship, and the Heroic in History. Uh, got a long quote here, but I'm not going to read all of it because it's, it's nonsense anyway. But right. basically he proposed that the history of the world is a history of great men who shaped uh, a society around them. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he'd point out like Napoleon or... Right. Uh, Julius Caesar. Yeah, Julius Caesar, if he had been later, even like Hitler or Martin Luther King. Right. Uh, But an opposing view is that those people are shaped by the society that they were born out of. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the Foundation series takes the latter view, which I find interesting, because most science fiction is all about, uh, most fiction in general, really, because you have to have a protagonist who, you know, changes things. Yeah. and uh, so you'll have, like, Luke Skywalker, you know, he's, like, the hero. He's the, right. you know, he redeems Darth Vader, you know, all yeah, that yeah. stuff. Yeah, exactly, um, yeah. And this finds a way to sort of sidestep that. It's got a little bit of great man with Harry Seldon himself, but you mm. could argue that he was also born out of the conditions. That, right, right. And uh, the mule is an exception because he's, but that's a genetic anomaly. Right. And we'll which, get into that, but right. yeah. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, he, he does have very clear protagonists and even, quote, great men. Salvar Hardin, Hober yeah. Vallow, who comes later, he becomes the merchant prince uh, of the foundation. Yeah, but it, it makes clear that these would have happened whether those people were born or not. Exactly. These uh, events would have happened. Right. And 
Yeah, I mean... Yeah, it's it's a case of, um, you know, it, it's not that these people weren't significant figures in history. It's that they would have arisen to meet the challenges, which, and they, they call it in the story, uh, Selden crises, yeah. uh, which occur every so often. Of course, there'll be, you know, things get pushed to a boiling point and uh, inevitably a leader or even, or even a group, although th- he does hint at a group uh, later on in uh, when the mule story is heating up, mm. that if it, things had gone normally, it would have been a group of people coming together to uh, overthrow the foundation, which had become a bit despotic at that point. Um, so he, he kind of implies that, you know, you will, ar- the right person will arise at the right time. So yeah, you have great men, but they came out of the circumstances of yeah. the time. Basically. Say, uh, with a real life example, Martin Luther King, like mm. he did great things. He was a very important figure, but he came out of a movement that already existed, right. that had existed for quite a while. And he was sort of the, not culmination, but like the. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now, this is actually something. So, this is something I'm considering. So, the foundation books were written uh, during and right after World War II. Um, and it is really interesting to consider um, what you're looking at. Plus, you've got Isaac Asimov, who was literally born in uh, Soviet Russia. Or actually, it was, I guess it wasn't strictly Soviet Russia when he was born because it was in the middle of the Civil War. I, it w- <laughs> you, can, you can debate whether or not it was Soviet Russia mm-hmm. because the Soviets hadn't 100% taken over when he was born. As I say, we're, we weren't totally clear. They came to America very young. He was raised in Brooklyn. He was like about five, I think, when they mm-hmm. came over. Um, so he's predates Stalin and all that. Um, but he did, you know, let his family would have seen the Russian Revolution and Lenin. And it's interesting. And he was even later uh, actually investigated as a uh, a communist spy uh, in the 60s. Uh, they knew there was an academic uh, in uh, in uh, who was spying for the Russians who was codenamed Rob Prof, uh, which actually sounds like robotics professor. Okay. Uh, so there was a theory that it was – and when I say that, I don't know if that was the FBI's uh, codename for him or if that was literally his Soviet codename. That would uh, be a pretty bad codename if it was him. Right. So that makes me think it was probably the FBI doing that. And I don't even know if, again, they knew Rob Prof before they said it's Asimov. Mm -hmm. Uh, They invested Asimov. They basically cleared him. He was cleared pretty quickly. They don't seem to have seriously thought he was involved. Uh, So you do start. Even if they did, you know, the FBI thought everybody was. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yes, there's that too. They were sending Martin Luther King Mm -hmm. notes to tell him to kill himself. You know, it's. Yeah, exactly. They've done some shady things, especially that. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, no, it's. How rely, but but the mere fact that they kind of let him off the hook right away suggests mm-hmm. that they like either they didn't think he was serious or they're really really incompetent, which is not impossible, I guess. Yep. <laughs> um, but I think he was a, he was established, well respected figure, and I don't think they wanted to pursue it that hard, mm-hmm. basically. Uh, and he's so his so you try to nail down his politics, and it gets a little interesting because. Um, He's, he takes a very detached view. Uh, as I was sort of researching this, I, I discovered that there was this group called uh, the Futurians, who were a group uh, within um, the science, the world of science fiction. Um, there was a guy named M- M- Michelle or Mikel, who was their leader for a while. And they were essentially a group of, apparently they were left-wing, utopian. Uh, and we've talked about this before in the past, how science fiction was clearly shaped by, like, socialism in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Like, in many ways, the idea of, well, we're going to build this great, shining future full of techno wonders that'll, mm-hmm. th- you know, in many ways that came out of socialism and even Marxism. Um, oh, what's the phrase now? Luxury, gay, space yeah. communism? Exactly, yeah. That's, Something like that, yeah. That's fall- that fell a bit by the wayside over the 20th century, but that was, that was sort of the dream. Uh, and even as the actual content of... Uh, you know, socialism, communism kind of drained out post-World War II, uh, that echo kind of stayed through science fiction. And it may have partly been because of this group of the Futurians uh, who probably had an influence on Asimov. Uh, essentially, it's the, the Star Trek future mm-hmm. as an aspirational thing is their politics, from what I yeah. understand. Uh, it's the idea of, yeah, well, we Although can... Although, as we'll probably be discussing in future episodes, Star Trek has sort of mixed, you know, not as clear-cut politics as... Mm-hmm. As it sometimes is made out to be. Right. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, Star Trek specifically, I've read this part of the series Bible of Star Trek, and they very specifically say, we're not going to talk, we don't know how this happened. We just got to a utopia. Yeah. We're, it's not about that. It's about the exploring and mm-hmm. going to outer space. But it is very much the idea of, you know, you like to think most people in the 50s and 60s were 
it, it was a fairly mainstream opinion of, well, you know, it'd be great if we could have the United Nations, if we could all get together, if we could destroy, you know, national conflict could be put aside, if we could have, you know, uh, feed everyone, whether you believed in, you know, and of course, communism is the bad thing, mm -hmm. but the people who are anti-communism had a similar viewpoint. They were like, yeah, but we want to get to that. We just don't think we can get there through communism yeah, or I mean, socialism. The 50s in America had a high tax rate. Right. And that was obviously gutted in the in the 80s, but right. yeah. Yeah, no, it was it was kind of like, unless you were a real full-on John Bircher reactionary uh, who was like, oh, the one world government is bad, <laughs> there was that group. But the mainstream was kind of the Kennedy and Johnson liberals mm -hmm. who were like, yeah, it's the world order under America, freedom and democracy for all. Not not necessarily in action, but in terms of oh, what yeah, they yeah. talked about, they wanted to uh, to The accomplish. rhetoric rather than the... Right. Yeah. And Asimov seems to have bought into that. Again, because it's science fiction, you can take a very detached view of it and be like, yes, this will be the ideal society. We're the philosopher kings and we will, mm. you know, build this great society. So that seems to have been Asimov's kind of guiding star. I read a, I don't know if you saw that I linked to it, a review of Orwell. I didn't did. get around to reading it, yeah. sorry. Well, it's very interesting because he talks about, you know, it's, there's some insight there, but he does talk about, well, Orwell was wrong about how computers will make us all, uh, will build up a surveillance state and stuff that didn't yeah. happen writing this in the mid 80s right oh um, god it was already happening yeah the exactly there were all <laughs> kinds of and he, and he was very he was very dismissive of the one thing to say he was like yeah communism is just it's it's fear-mongering you know everyone afraid of communism so i mean if you want to put a mark in the in the corner of asimov was sympathetic to communism you could mm -hmm. look at that review but he was much again he was much more of a just a detached guy uh he apparently broke with 60s radical like he was pretty left-wing but he you know as the 60s came up he was like oh, i don't agree with these radicals they're too emotional that was <laughs> his take on that basically that makes sense yeah he, he kind of like he wasn't unsympathetic to some of their aims i guess but he didn't he thought oh yeah they're just you know it's all a bunch of crazy hippies you know they don't they don't have a focus on where they're gonna you know steer the movement if there is a movement uh he was sympathetic to the civil rights movement so you know he was he was very much a you know the guy who i feel like he was the guy phil oaks sang about with love me i'm a liberal uh you know he's that kind of guy like he had all the right opinions but he didn't he wasn't out on the streets marching for mm -hmm. anything you know it's that guy and he was very from an academic point of view yeah so he, he had a very detached viewpoint on everything which which fits with the foundation series because it is about taking a, uh, a detached view on everything oh yeah it's it's very um th there are like you said there are characters and uh uh particularly with the uh stuff with the mule there th we follow them a bit that cast a bit closer mm -hmm. but for the most part it's a very um uh bird's eye view of the whole situation yeah right yeah i mean like he'll leap decades between stories sometimes you'll get a character and then the next story will be remember that great character who accomplished <laughs> great things and it was like they they just you just read that story about his yeah. life where he was a regular person and suddenly he's being deified as a hero and he's been dead for two decades or whatever like that kind of leap happens throughout the stories which makes sense because you have to keep moving forward through time and mm. seeing the evolution of the foundation uh we should talk about the mule but in what just one last thing i do want to mention which kind of a weird interesting little uh, quirk uh in terms of politics uh there's a book by uh, six in Lou, which won the Hugo uh, recently, uh, called the Three Body Pro Problem. A few years back, it won the Hugo for best science fiction novel. Um, and um, he writes about this is his, he's a Chinese writer, but it was translated into English. And he writes about um, uh, uh, them meeting a terrorist leader who's very. I don't think they actually say it's Osama bin Laden, but they strongly imply it's Osama bin Laden, and that he was um, probably that his terrorist organization is called the Foundation. Now, that's a potential translation of Al-Qaeda as the foundation. It's usually translated as the base, but it could also be translated as okay. the foundation as in the... And that's the pun that Asimov does, which is literally uh, the, you know, like it literally starts as like an academic foundation, but then it becomes the foundation of a new society. That's the that's the pun of the title, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so Six and Lil literally goes on to suggest that Osama bin Laden read the foundation books, and that was part of the inspiration for, <laughs> for what he was doing, which is, I, I, I think he was joking, but it's that's pretty wild, like that he put that yeah. in the book. Um, but it's, it's, it's the same idea of, I'm a great philosopher and I'm going to build a new society. You know, this is kind of the ground zero of that in some ways. Oh, and before we get into that, I just, because I didn't, I couldn't think of a way to uh, segue into this naturally, but I remember the, uh, the iRobot movie with Will Smith. Mm -hmm. All the posters were, the tagline was, One Man Saw It Coming. Which sort of describes mm. these books better than the iRobot series quite yes. a bit. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. That's right. Um, 
and again, they do the two do join up. We'll talk about that in a minute. Anyway, but just to, to discuss the mule. So um, yeah, you were. Uh, yeah, about. he's um, uh, he's a mutant. Mm -hmm. uh, born of a genetic anomaly, and he has the power to shape people's emotions. And he can permanently rewrite somebody's sort of emotional response so they become very loyal to him. Right. Yeah. He's... Um, yeah. So he's something that couldn't be predicted by Selden's plan because he's just a quirk of genetics rather than a, a societal movement. So he disrupts everything. Yeah. And that kind of points to why... Uh, one of the things I do appreciate about Asimov is he's constantly sort of going back and reexamining his own premises and and recalculating and and like he'll you know if somebody if he writes a story and people will say whether it's his critics or he himself they'll go yeah but what about this yeah you know, he'll go back and he'll write a story to oh they, this series that. is full of that right so he's constantly adjusting itself and 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 reanalyzing itself and yeah that is that is sort of the reason why psychohistory would probably never work in real life because it doesn't take not only the idea of that you could have a, a mutant in this case it's a genetic mutant who has the power to to basically uh, amass an army to overthrow to to knock history off course but um it's also the fact that, you know, you couldn't you can't really predict technological advancements yep. through this method either. So And and the book acknowledges that, but it, it's sort of at a period where technology is at its height and it can't really be improved on that much. That's true. Yeah, it because it starts with an empire that literally controls the entire galaxy. So it's also not like we're going to discover another civilization and that's going to it's it's like no, we control the entire galaxy. Oh, and uh, the, it's all humans. There's no aliens in this right. world. Yes. And that was apparently a thing because uh we've discussed John F., uh uh John W. Campbell before. Um, if you remember, did, did we talk about it in, uh, one of the other shows yeah, with yeah. Campbell? It just, he didn't like aliens or rather oh, okay. he, he didn't believe that aliens could ever be superior to humans, okay. which was probably a very thinly veiled, uh, displacement of his racism. Yeah. <laughs> um, we talked about him in the Nova episode. Right. Yeah. And it's, and you know, and Campbell did employ Samuel R. Delaney, but he said apparently he would, he would get angry at his, and, and he let them sometimes do what they wanted to do, even if he disagreed with them. But Asimov basically thought, you know what? I don't want to fight with Campbell. He's generally my friend. He's like, he had very good things to say about Campbell who gave him his spot, his mm -hmm. shot and really built up his career. And he was like, I don't want to fight with this guy by writing stories in which aliens are superior to humans, even though I think it's ridiculous that you can't write a story <laughs> where aliens are superior to humans, but I don't want to, jeopardize my career or in the early going and then later it was just I don't want to jeopardize my friendship with Campbell so I just will not write stories with aliens and so it wasn't until much later that he started writing novels with aliens in them for that exact reason basically um but yeah so y you couldn't have um yeah, you, you need to start with the Empire because you can't have these external factors, and then even then you get the mule, and that, that knocks everything off, yeah. of course. Um, it is a very... It starts to get very gripping once the mule comes into factor, because yeah. now... Yeah, and uh, there's... I actually didn't quite see the twist coming. I, I predicted some aspects of it. Basically, uh, th this section is about uh, two uh, people on their honeymoon, but they, they travel and to right. uh, uncover... They get involved in a very pulpy adventure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is sort of explained later. <laughs> right. Um, but um, basically, they're they're uh, trying to overthrow the foundation, which has become corrupt at that point and despotic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they travel to um, oh, what was the planet the mules? Calgan. Calgan. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I remember. I needed I to Cal be Calgan. Yeah. Take me away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they travel to Calgan. Um, and um, because uh, there's a warlord that's taken over there called the Mule, and nobody knows anything about him because he doesn't show himself in public and so forth. Um, and uh, they come across a clown, a jester, who used to work for the Mule. And um, then they go off on an adventure. All well, they rescue him. Yeah, he's, they he's rescue him. He's like, yeah. help me, help me. So they, they spring to his yeah. defense, and that gets them wrapped up in this uh, yeah. adventure. And then his one of the other people, because like I say, they're they're sort of building a uh, a revolution, like a quiet rebellion mm -hmm. uh, against the, the, the foundation, and, and they meet with one of the leaders, and he's like, yeah, oh, this, uh, this guy, this jester, he could help us because he's seen the mule. Most people have never even seen the mule. Yeah. They don't know anything about him, right? And the mule's described as being exceptionally strong because... And that's why he's called the mule. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, it, it turns out that the jester is the mule. Right. Um, and that uh, 
He's been subtly manipulating things. Right. That's uh, why they leapt to his defense, because he basically emotionally yeah. prodded them to save him. I- and exactly. And it. that's why they've been on this weird, pulpy adventure, because, mm-hmm. as they say, this thing, this sort of thing doesn't happen to people in real life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's all been sort of orchestrated. But he's actually in love with the with the woman, with the female character, Beta. Mm-hmm. Um, well, in not uh not romantically in love necessarily yeah though there's shades of that but because she actually respected him as a person he latched onto them partly because they were part of the underground but also partly because he saw beta in beta that she had you know the heroic qualities he needed including being kind and, mm-hmm. and nice and he just was like oh this is but you know, uh, he refused to actually manipulate her because he, she want he wanted her emotions to be genuine Mm -hmm. and you also find that becomes his downfall right and he also says at the end of course he's he's in a way he's not really interested in romantic love because it turns out that's why he calls himself the mule right he's sterile yeah (laughs) because he's sterile um but uh yeah and the reason he's using them is to get a hold of the second foundation which we didn't talk about oh yeah, yeah. yeah harry selden at the beginning sets up two foundations though the second foundation is not he doesn't describe it in much detail he just sort of mentioned and on the other side of the galaxy, we'll set up the second foundation. Right. Um, and he doesn't elaborate on that. Right. And so there's all this sort of questioning of what, if that exists, if what it's doing, if it's still that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they're looking for the second foundation in order to, to overthrow the mule. And uh, they go to, oh, we haven't really discussed Trantor, I guess. Yeah, Trantor is the capital city of the Empire, as it starts. The out. capital planet. Capital planet, which rather, yeah. Which but is but also both, a city. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a city planet, so <laughs> right. it's like Coruscant from Star Wars. Yeah, it's it's not hard to see the influence of uh, this series on Star Wars, both the Galactic Empire, the fact that the capital is a city that spans the entire uh, planet. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of you know, it's a it's sort of a crumbling. If you look to at the, the very first Star Wars. Um, you know, the way they're describing the Empire fits very much with the way the Foundation is. Like, they possibly weren't as caught up with the idea of uh, the Empire as this massive opponent in and of itself as it was the backdrop for fighting Darth Vader in mm-hmm. some ways. Um, and and the Foundation and Empire has the same idea of the Empire getting... You know, it was arguably a little more benign at the time of Harry Seldon, but it was crumbling. And, yeah. And by the time, and then there is a story which we skipped over, but they do eventually run into the remnants of the Empire, and it's being led by uh, by uh, Bell Rios, uh, a great well, he's general. The general. Yeah. yeah. Who wants? Well, sorry, he's not being led by the Empire, but he's the he's the go to general who wants to actually conquer and sort of bring life back to the Empire. But he's he's very brutal and fascist so between that and all the other stuff you can see the elements of star wars kind of being remade. yeah particularly the prequels or at least the overall arc of the prequels right uh which you know i have uh there's been some critical re-examination of the prequels i still don't really like them uh but there's a good idea there there's definitely a lot of good ideas there well in many ways i think the prequels are just what lucas had had in mind as the backdrop of star wars and when it was time to do them he just kind of went back to that i think Mm -hmm. so even with the with like the very first star wars i think that was always there's mention of that that they've just disillusioned or dis uh what's the word i'm looking for uh, just dissolved the dissolved uh, the Senate, yeah. yeah, the Galactic Senate, which is of course what happened in ancient Rome as well, more yeah. or less. Um, the Empire basically decided, yeah, no, let's not stop pretending we're a republic. We're just <laughs> an empire now, basically. Um, yeah, it's true. The Empire, like if you, I've read the Star Wars novelization uh, of the first book, and the the Emperor is at, literally described as um, not um, like just nobody like not that okay. important uh it's it's the bureaucrats who run the empire and people like uh, moff tarkin and uh vader even sort of just contemptuously talks about it he's described as talking about the emperor just contemptuously okay. in a scene that was cut so that was again that was just sort of the backdrop and the empire was but no kind of, it was all planned out from the start <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it definitely was not um yeah no it was more just uh, like they were more focused on darth vader and they brought in the emperor because they first of all you know, it was going to be about fighting the emperor, empire, but it's it's a little harder to, in a pulpy way, nail down one big villain yeah. when it's more. No, it's a crumbling bureaucracy and a bunch of militaristic generals. <laughs> That's not as satisfying to just yeah, we kill that guy and we win. You yeah. Know? So yeah. Which, uh, uh, but this whole thing himself. being about the fall of the Roman Empire is interesting too because that's been latched on uh, politically lately uh, by 
right wing people mm. uh that the fall of the roman empire was you know mm -hmm. they allowed too much immigration or taxes or whatnot right, it's yeah. all nonsense because it fell over the course of hundreds of years right it didn't f collapse in you know right. in a decade i mean even even gibbons who we talked about uh when he talked about the decline his his big th series is like the decline is when it became an empire in some ways mm -hmm. i mean he he sort of says well I've, i mean it reached a point of glory under Julius and Augustus to a degree, or under Augustus, who was following on what Julius Caesar wanted. Uh, but I mean, that was also sowing the seeds of its own defeat, because it stopped being a republic, it stopped being, you know, an open, and and, and then suddenly you've got this, uh, this chain of, you know, you know, deteriorating people, some of whom were literally insane. Yeah, uh, you know. and it split off into two different parts, one of which right. lasted longer than the other. You know, right, it's, yeah. Well, you, that you, was hundreds of years later. But yeah, I know, I, but I, you I, can't pin down one, because if you say, you know, this what this is what led to the sure. fall of the Roman Empire, and it's something that happened early on mm -hmm. in the fall, you know, right. there were still hundreds of years of sure. the Roman Empire being around. Uh, well, and this is, but this is the thing, though. I mean, you can argue that be, by becoming this militaristic expansionist empire where, you know, the, the emperor was this, you know, decaying husk. And uh, meanwhile, we had to keep going outside and conquering nations and having brutal gladiatorial fights to keep bread and circuses to keep the populace in control. Like, even when it was strong under that mentality, you had, like, Caligula and Nero running it. And it was yeah. not in good shape, except that it was strong and conquering the world. Yeah. But it, would already, it had already, like, gone off the rails. It's just, and as soon as that... As soon as it stopped being able to maintain itself in any realistic way, it was doomed to failure because it had thrown away all the infrastructure that mm -hmm. it needed. I'm an expert in the Roman Empire because I watched I, Claudius <laughs> yeah. a couple of years ago. You're right. uh <laughs> yep. Well, as as you see, it's like it, it is hilarious how almost immediately you had like Tiberius who was meh, and then you get to Caligula, like the yeah. third Roman Empire emperor is one of the worst ones they ever had, yeah. right? And Nero, and Nero as well, yeah. you know. Although so, some people say Nero's been given a bad rap and because Christians wrote about him because he banned Christianity. So some of the stuff we hear about Nero might be Christian historians of the time talking about you how mean horrible he was. that Doctor Who episode where he burns down Rome to in order to, because yeah. uh, uh, he wants to build up a you know his own the city yeah. in his own image, right? And so he intentionally burns Rome himself. That didn't happen? <laughs> well, actually, historians do say that might have happened. Like, oh, okay. There is some discussion over whether Nero's agents set the big fire that burned down Rome. But, but he, they used it as an excuse to blame Christians. So, yeah, yeah okay. that was definitely a thing. Um, it's, it's, it, it is debate. It's just, when you talk about how horrible Nero was, you have to remember he's mostly being, you know, written about by, in the near in the immediate aftermath by his enemies, right? Yeah. So, you know, you can maybe be a bit skeptical of some of the stuff. But at the same time, he's the head of a, he's a despotic leader of an empire, like, who obviously... Who is persecuting religions. Yeah, You exactly. know, that, that's a bad thing in and of itself. Right. Um, anyway, but, um, yeah, the second foundation we were talking about. Yeah. Uh, uh, how do you want to go well, about... Well, just as it turns out, the second foundation was uh, made up of psychohistorians. Yeah. And there were no... Uh, his psycho historians in the foundation, the original foundation, yeah, uh, because that would literally that would dis it's it's the whole um, thing about if you think too hard about what how you move your muscles, you stop being able to do it. Mm -hmm. Because if they if the psycho historians knew where history was headed, they would uh, they wouldn't be able to. It, like the whole point is that it's supposed to just move naturally in that yeah. direction, right? But of course, when the mule starts up, that derails the Selden plan. Yeah. Um. So that but Selden had set up this. Uh, the second foundation to deal with things like that potentially, so they could right. they could further manipulate right um, and further uh, perfect the plan because right. they found flaws in it. Right. So they're the ones who know psycho historians, and that and the big uh, you know, and that's where it really gets gripping because now it's like, okay, now there's a chance that the plan is off the rails. Can the second foundation get it back onto the rails essentially? Yeah. Um, and it turns out they've essentially been. You know, just spoiler, but they they they've been secretly lurking among uh, the the empire the whole time. They say the edge of the galaxy, and there's a lot of discussion over uh, where is the ed the other. Yeah, end of there's the galaxy. lots of different, and they all seem plausible at first. Right, like you they know. say, well, wait a minute, is that it's you know, is that literally exactly opposite to the the first foundation? Is it like what's the one they come up with where if you look through a you know a star? Oh, it's, it's like, um yeah the um. The other side of the galaxy, because the galaxy is a flat spiral, so yeah. you go to the other side and you wind up where you are. So right. they say the it's actually they're operating on 
terminus on this planet right. in secret. Right. Uh, it turns out that it was on Trantor. Right. Uh, which by this point had become a just a farming planet. Right. Uh, like a agricultural based planet. Right. Um, but but all through the galaxy, like they for to work, they had to have agents. All yeah, through the yeah. Galaxy but as well. uh, but their their main uh, headquarters is on is on Trantor, right. which uh, is at the center of the galaxy. So the the spiral. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it also, uh, it's not necessarily meant literally the mm-hmm. other end of the galaxy because Selden was a. Uh, psychologist rather than a physical scientist. Right. So uh, the other end of the galaxy is the other end politically. So right. Trantor at the time was the was the largest, you know, up city, city size or a planet sized city. Right. It was, and the, the other end would just be some backwater out of nowhere. Right. So yeah, exactly. You've got, um, but yeah. So so they've been sort of secretly working among us the whole time to mm-hmm. to maintain and they've it. developed psychic powers. Right. Yeah. W- essentially, it's basically when you're good enough at psychology, you become essentially psychic, so they can combat. The yeah. Mule. It does. It does deal with like the you know they don't outright say humans only use ten percent of our brains, but they sort of say that. Yeah. Well, Asimov would have nonsense. known. Yeah. <laughs> not that. That's, yeah. Well, maybe they. they, they, they there's a line about. Um, uh, humans uh, only use a, a fraction of their brains at a time. Right. And when it's over, when you use the whole brain, it overloads, and that's what because uh, the mule was uh, was using a scientist to try to find the second foundation, and he was sort of overcharging his brain. Right. Yeah. And yeah, Asimov was pretty like he would have been very much against saying like that kind. Yeah. Of thing. It doesn't <laughs> say it, but like you yeah. know, there's a bit of yeah. But you know, it's well, pulp. he said, he he basically he gives them telep- telep- telepathy, but he sort of rationalizes it as well. It's because they're so good at psychology, they can communicate with each other, and they can understand people, and they can manipulate people so well by hardly doing anything. That's that's how good they are, basically. I, I think there is some lines about its you know hidden potential of humans being able to right. But, uh, and, of course, the mule is straight-up psychic. So. Right, the, the mule is telepathic. So, yeah, you could link to that, and he needs it for the story. Now, it's really interesting. So, I, when, I, when I said this to Phil, I said, read the first three books. Asimov did come back uh, much later uh, and write four more books uh, at, the, at, the, at his publisher's behest and the, the fans' behest. Uh, Foundation's Edge, Foundation and Earth, uh, Prelude to Foundation, and Forward the Foundation. The first, those last two are, are prequels. Uh, about Selden as a young man on Trantor having adventures. And it's um, it's actually, um, he said he did that because, and he said, like, you can never get to the end and see the new future that they're going to build. Like that, you by definition, you have to leave it at open, mm-hmm. basically. Um, so that was the thing he said. And, he, and he, he also said, I just have no idea where to take the story at that point. But one thing that is significant um, in those uh, final stories is that um, he does have, a, the climax of Foundation's Edge is... Uh, them meeting up with um, a third party, uh, who we'll talk about, I'll talk about in a minute, uh, but who basically says, okay, the, the two foundations, the first foundation discovers, or at least people within the first foundation, discover the existence of the second foundation. They start basically competing with each other for two different visions of the, of the, the future. And you see that that is inherent in what he's done the first foundation is like yeah we want to rebuild the empire but it was an empire is an empire really a good thing you know Mm -hmm. like there's got and plus it collapsed and you know all the other problems with it um the second foundation is like yeah no we want to build a new and better world Mm -hmm. that like that will be more humane and so but the trouble is you're going to create a world where you're the ruling elite of that world uh that has the potential to go really bad because the the psycho historians will be the new you know philosopher kings yeah Yeah. exactly but worse than that because they'll be like yeah well we're the higher ruling caste and you can never you know and then there the third uh option was just basically the entire galaxy becoming sentient and that implicitly is the more positive of the three options uh the 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 implicit idea is that that's the better but the 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 hero of the foundation's edge uh is actually basically told which of these three would you like to (laughs) pursue because the psychics are starting to emerge but they're not connected to the second foundation they're basically saying well we could pursue one of these three tracks which ones do you want and you don't actually hear which one he picked but it it implies that it was for the idea of a sentient galaxy as mm-hmm. a whole. Then in the next one and in the prequels as well, you're you're told that there was a character running around named Reed Daniel Olivaw. Do you know about uh, Reed Daniel Olivaw? No. 
Okay. Um, I've th- heard the name because we have a friend on Twitter who goes by that, but yeah. Yeah, Daniel, Daniel Oliva is the, uh, sorry, just Daniel Oliva. Uh, they, they're a robot from the robot series. Um, they show up later in the iRobot series. Okay. As the first humanoid robot. Uh, I haven't read those stories, but I know that they are, uh, they basically become a robot who formulates what's called the zeroth law of the robotics. If you know the three laws of, that, of robotics, yeah. uh, it's, you know, a robot will not hurt a human or by an action cause a, ro- a human to come to harm. Uh, a robot will uh, uh, not obey harm- a human. No, oh, yeah. Second is obey a human unless that conflicts with the, the first law. And the third one was they'll protect themselves unless that conflicts with the first two laws. And other robots as well. And other unless robots. Unless it conflicts with the first two. Right. And but, the zeroth is, is, I believe, the idea that they... Uh, uh, oh, sorry. You 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 probably know no, this better. Well, go ahead. No, uh, I from my hear. understanding, it's it's the idea that uh, humans don't know what's best for themselves. So, in order to preserve the other three laws, we have to right. take take over human society. Essential. Well, it, that's it's not. It's specifically protect humanity. Yeah. Uh, not. But but yes, it, it it gets incorporated in some versions as the whole thing that it was meant to prevent, which was a robot rebellion, is the robots going. Well, okay, but. To protect humanity, we have to prevent war. We have to prevent, you know, there's an argument you can go to, like, humans shouldn't have any control over their lives because they can get themselves into trouble. So if we're going to protect them, we should rule, basically, yeah. and in a society. Uh, you can see elements of this in the Matrix movies, actually, mm-hmm. um, which is basically, uh, there's, it's, uh, the specific explanation in the Matrix movies is different, but you can see the element of, well, everything's going to be better if we're in charge, even though we were made to serve humanity because we can serve humanity. And you can argue that's why the robots in the matrix didn't want to just kill all the humans. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've heard the, the argument that they're not necessarily trying to punish humans, right. but they're actually in, in some way, even though they're, because in the Animatrix stuff, they reveal that there was a whole war, you know, right. well, we know about the war, but like they, they were slaves and so forth. Right. And, um, but, uh, the idea is with the Matrix, they're still trying to serve humanity in a weird way. Right. Because he even specifically says we wanted to build a utopia a paradise for humans originally. That was our plan. Uh, but that didn't work. So we had to sort of go down to the next level. But they're always trying to look after the humans yeah. in a way. <laughs> so just in a way that's kind of in a way horrific, horrific because mm-hmm. they, don't quite, uh, they don't quite get it. Um, anyway, that kicks in here. And you find out that Daniil Oliva has been... Um, uh, manipulating um, uh, human affairs in- up to and including Harry Seldon thousands of years later trying to sort of plant the ideas of psychohistory and letting humans do the work and so he can move back. So he's been the secret and he is he's he knows like he can make himself live a very long time but his body's breaking down faster and faster so he keeps even though he's still going thousands and thousands of years he's trying to find a way that humans can look after themselves. So he's a more benign benevolent figure essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is very it, it, so but that was just Asimov going okay I'm going to tie together all my big <laughs> stories uh, in ways that create uh, timeline conflicts that don't quite make sense unfortunately. Yeah. Uh- um, the foundation. I don't think we've mentioned this, but the foundation series takes place in a, like we said, galactic empire. But it's so far in the future they don't even know what planet they originated on. Right. Like there's various theories going around, and yeah, that's what the found- word Earth is never used in the first three books anyway. Right. The foundation in Foundation and Earth, it's a hunt for Earth, which ends up being a hunt for Daniel Oliva. They meet. They meet him on uh, earth's moon when they finally find it but it's literally like well there's a planet called solaria maybe that's like they can't figure out what it was because and but again that's tied into uh the robot stories because those are very early settled planets in the robot timeline uh as people pointed out uh the timeline doesn't quite match up between the two because in the robots they get into outer space in a few hundred years and in uh the empire uh, thing it takes thousands of years to start colonizing other planets anyway uh but yeah so he did try to tie it all together i think that was you know that was just to appeal his nerdy fans <laughs> essentially uh, and those books aren't quite as good and you know they, they feel a little more irrelevant but he does tie in some interesting ideas again criticisms of the series that had been going on and you know what about this is that really yeah the good, you know? the whole thing is felt um yeah i was um uh are you had did you watch Gargoyles, the cartoon? <laughs> uh, I've seen parts of it, yeah. Okay, there's a the main villain, or he's somewhat sympathetic, but he's a villain, Xanatos. Yeah, yeah. David Xanatos, who's voiced by... Um, yeah, Jonathan uh, Franks. Yeah, yeah, Jonathan yeah. Franks, Riker from... There's a lot of Star Trek actors on that show. Yeah. Uh, but um, he uh, has a, a trope that they, they figured out for him, um, and it probably it predates 
uh, right. the show, but like it, he sort of exemplifies it. It's been called the Xanatos Gambit. And, right. Uh, basically, it's a way for the uh, villain to win even when he loses. Right. So, uh, say uh, the episode, you know, he, he seems to have a plan and the gargoyles stop him, mm-hmm. but then it turns out that there was a secret element of the plan that he still sort of won. Right. So it, it's a good way to make the villain seem competent and the right. hero seem competent at the same time. Right, right. Um, it's it, Now, I'm not clear if that specifically means a plan B or if it means, no, my plan was to lose all along. I, I think it can be either one. Right, okay. Um, and there's another trope that's connected. Sorry, I'm using TV trope stuff. I know that's it's, okay. <laughs> I know it's got issues, but yeah. Uh, I think it was called the 100 Xanatos Pileup. <laughs> where different characters are using Xanatos gambits against each other, and yeah, it, it, it causes... Does. And really, I mean, towards the end of the Foundation trilogy, uh-huh. it really becomes that with uh, the um, Second Foundation versus the uh, anti-Second Foundation people. Right. It, like, they, they all have plans within plans against each other, and, you know, right. uh, you may have stopped me, but that was actually part of my plan, and then yeah, the other person yeah. says the same, you know. It's, yeah. Well, it's it's that, that's why I think, yeah, you end in the trilogy where where it's it's kind of it's unclear I, that's that's why I like to end it at the end of the first trilogy because it's unclear whether has the Selden plan been disrupted can it be put on track is this all yet more part of the Selden plan yeah. <laughs> like it's not clear it seems like everything's crazy and ambiguous enough that it creates a lot more drama and tension than the early going where it's like well whatever happens the Selden plan is the stakes are individual not for the larger world of the story mm-hmm. because you know that can't be derailed uh, uh, I, I still the enjoyed plan. the early stories as like oh, yeah, vignettes yeah. and like uh, mm-hmm. uh, see how it works even if you know it's going to work like right. it's like a Perry Mason you know yeah, it's yeah. not that he wins it's how he wins right and it's not well as they say it's not even about oh the hero's gonna win it's like no the hero could lose maybe that's what makes it work is that the hero loses basically and we've seen how the people even in the the trilogy i feel like people go like well the foundation can't lose it's like well technically speaking it could that could be part of the plan for the foundation to lose and and there's various parts in it where it it doesn't come to fruition because the mule but the foundation was supposed to right uh because it was it had become despotic by that point right it was supposed to uh there's supposed to be a revolution they were supposed to lose basically yeah there was supposed to be it, yeah they were supposed to over th- like the individual power got too concentrated and less democratic and it was supposed to be overthrown by a revolution again if you want to tie it on to both real world history both like post roman empire and even 20th century like uh communism uh you you know in the way the mule is kind of the stalin of (laughs) of -hmm. this it's like there was going to be a healthy revolution that would have overthrown you know the the despots but this one guy came along said no no no, i'm going to control everything and he had he was able to grab all this power at a time when everyone else would have been revolving revolting or maybe a hitler sort of um right because it's it's debatable you know i i personally don't think all that stuff would have happened without Hitler specifically as a person. Right. And usually I'm against the great man theory, but I think in this case he did. He was, the yeah. whole situation was so unusual that, um, well, that's a long discussion. Yeah, I know. I know. I don't, I do feel like, um, in those cases it was, um, combination like, of things. Like, I think I, I've always said, like, don't forget, people always forget, uh, um, that um, Mussolini predated uh, predated Hitler, yeah, and even Stalin, Hitler was probably looking at those guys and going, "Oh, I want what those guys are having." Yeah, basically, and, and he used and what even was even Mussolini was inspired by what's his face, uh, Gabriel D'Annunzio. Well, according to our calculations, that's it for this episode. We've been psycho historian extraordinaire Adam Prosser and Galactic Emperor Philip Rice. Our producer and engineer is Grand High Science Priest Alex Ross, and the theme song was by the mutant historical aberration Jack Furick. I just want to remind everyone that we both have Patreons, and subscribers can listen to the show a week early. Uh, just look under Philip Rice or Adam Prosser at patreon.com, or go to NeverSleepsNetwork slash series slash what dash mad dash universe for the links. Uh, if you sign up, you also get comics, illustrations, and other stuff, and you'll help us afford the hosting and recording costs. Um, you can also get into the podcast via iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or your podcast broadcaster of choice. And if you enjoy it, please leave a review. It would also help us if you'd spread the word about What Mad Universe, tell your friends, or link to us on social media. We appreciate all our adventure-loving listeners, and we hope Season 2 will be even better. So let's go forth into the future and build a better galaxy. 